India comes down from 24.5% to 19.7 in 1800, 17.6 in 1830, 8.6 in 1880, 1.7 in 1900. In 100 years, the entire Indian economy, society, polity, people, their confidence, their standards of living collapse. From a quarter of world's GDP, India comes to 1.7% of world's GDP. China comes down from 32.8 to 6.2. America and Britain go from 2% together to 41% in this period. The whole nation, the whole world stands upside down. What does this mean? Bayrock and Leboya, his partner, wrote in the year 1981, it is very unlikely that in the middle of the 19th century, 19th century middle, in the year 1830, India had a 20% share of world GDP. China had 33% of world GDP. And America and Britain put together 5.1%. This is 18, uh, 19, 1830. In the middle of 19th century, the average standard of living in Europe was a bit lower than the standard of living of the people in Asia. They shook and then Fernand Braudel, a French historian, he wrote, Europe, unlike today, far from he reached a level of wealth vastly superior to the living standards of people in the rest of the world. So a big question mark came before the West. Whether the West was really an economic leader? Was West the generator of prosperity? Or was it Asia, India and China in particular? Then the London economist quoted all this research in 1990 to say further research needs to be done. And this further research was done. Angus Madison, who is considered to be the greatest economic historian of the world, was chosen by the OECD countries. OECD countries is the countries which are the richest countries in the world. Their networked system is OECD. And they chose Paul Bayro, uh, uh, Angus Madison to verify whether what Paul Bayro says is correct or not. And they give him a mandate and give him all the infrastructure needed. They institute a research called Development Studies Institute, funded profusely statisticians, uh, sociologists, economists and modelers, everybody was played, historians, they were all placed at his disposal. And the question which was posed by Angus Madison to himself, I am reading out. If Bayrock is right, then much more of the backwardness of the third world, we are the third world. Third world presumably has to be explained by colonial exploitation and much less of Europe's advantage can be due to scientific precocity, centuries of slow, slow accumulation and organizational financial superiority. The primary reason for the development of the West over the rest has to be only colonial exploitation. Everything else would have played only a marginal role because the world could not have shifted like this unless colonial exploitation was the prime drive. And if all, what Paul Bayrock says is true, then the West has to concede that it won a political war and not an economic war. This was the question before Angus Madison in the year 1983 when he started the research. And there was a question. I think the evidence supports Lande and Kusnets, who came to the conclusion that what Paul Bayrock is saying is bakwas, it has no meaning, the man is misguided, his statistics is wrong. So this is what two historians said. And so Angus Madison said, I have to now find out who is correct. Then Madison came out with not a study of 250 years, he came out with a study of 2000 years from the first year of the common era to 2000. And he came out with these figures in the first year of the common era after the birth of Christ. If you looked at the economic growth model of the world, India was leading the world with 32% of world GDP and China with 
In the year 1000, India leading with 28, China 22. In the year 1500, India and China almost equal at 24.5. In the year 1600, India was below China, 22.3, China 28.9. In 1700, India overtakes China, 24.4, 22.2 China. Afterwards, both of them lose out. When I mention this and ask the IIT students, do you know about this? Honestly, raise your hand and tell me. None of them raise their hand. And I said, where is the finding of Karl Marx that this is a semi-barbaric society? Will a semi-barbaric society function like this? We will worship monkeys and produce money. <laughs> we will worship cows and produce prosperity. You know, these are, these are not isolated researches. In American Economic Journal, two brothers, the Hegias from India, conducted a research that the first export-led model of development in India was followed under Chandragupta Maurya and India had a huge trade surplus with all the European countries, particularly with Rome and Egypt and Rome and Greece. With the result, there are Roman Egyptian records which show that India is draining out the gold reserves of Rome so much that the annual trade surplus of India translated in today's terms with a small country, Egypt, translated in today term, today's terms was 172 million dollars. And Rome was worried that its reserves were being drained out. And in 1300, Marco Polo, he writes his memoirs in which he says, the ships in India were the largest in the world with three decks and 300 crews are needed to drive the Indian ship and they are made to last for 100 years. How many people know the British people destroyed the shipping industry in India? They passed orders the Indians should not make ships. And they prevented wood being transported to cutting of, making of ships in the Hooghly River. And they said Indian goods should not be transported to England or any European country on Indian ships. Mahatma Gandhi said, the British destroyed the Indian shipping so that the British shipping becomes prosperous. This is not the history with the IIT students knew. They had never heard of Marco Polo. They had never heard of Marco Polo's travels, travel. So when I mentioned all this, all the students stood on the chair and then again clapped. But Mr. Adi Godrich, God I, I must say to his credit, he sat and listened to my speech. It went on for an hour and 20 minutes. It is there, available in six parts in YouTube. If any of you is interested to waste that kind of time, you can have the benefit of that speech. <laughs> so much so, when I was talking, it was 2010 November. William Dalrymple, a British historian who has done so much study about India, he wrote an article on the occasion of the 60th anniversary of India's freedom. And he said, don't think India's rise today is a rags to riches story. It is an empire which has lost out in the last 150 years, striking back to acquire its position. This he wrote in Guardian newspaper in UK. Nobody in IIT knew this. So all the students and faculty members joined together and told me, Mr. Gurumurthy, we don't want you to stop with a lecture. We want you to conduct a course for us. I had to run a 10-week course for them last year, and I am continuing to do it this year. And 98 students out of 120 <laughs> of the MBA have registered in this course. You know, how much of a pain it is that you believe the colonial discourse about India, to assess India, to judge India, to pronounce on India, to brand India. And you do not do anything about the researches which have been done and declared as the most authentic economic history of the world by OECD, whose website bears the Angus Madison report, who kept on publishing his reports from 2001 to 2010, June, when he died. And he wrote that India's decline was political. It was not economic. 
if you talk so low about a country about your civilization about your way of life about your tradition about your religion about your society how will you get ignited the entire indian discourse is not to ignite india but to subside india if india grew it grew because of the indian potentialities and i am immediately coming to it to show how as persons who protested against the establishment view about india we were pilloried we were trivialized and how economists like dr jagdish bhagavati who was the backbone of the wto who was called the god of free trade he was brought to india by dr manmohan singh in the year 1993 he was asked to explain what's wrong with india we don't know how to handle india it's such a messy society messy economy messy politics please tell us how we can grow this is what the then prime finance minister and now the prime minister dr manmohan singh asked dr jagdish bhagwati dr jagdish bhagwati said the problem with india is because the indians save more than what they need to save and they should be asked to spend is it they are the indian families are saving 19 to 20% of their of the gdp and so much of their disposable income and unless you cut down their savings from 20 to 10% and make this 10% savings into expenditure into consumption and to production and to supply and to then it builds your whole economy because the consumption driven model is the western idea of growth particularly the american model of growth is to promote consumption and the indian government began doing all this and they cut the tariff rates and uh, they opened the economy and investments were brought from outside and dr jagdish bhagwati is asked how will you finance development if there is no savings don't worry foreigners will come and invest money and you leave the investment to them you take care of the expenditure you know this was not an advice privately given this was an advice given in a document which runs over 72 pages which was on the website of the government of india till 2007 i don't know when they removed why they removed it afterwards and in that he made a three para comment on the indian families and particularly about indian women he said that the problem of india is the families are not spending in that the problem are the women they are very stingy you must make them spend and so open huge malls import such attractive goods textiles jewelry cosmetics that women must move out of their bearings don't care for anything and begin buying turn them into consumers this was such a specific advice given to the government of india to turn the psychology of the indian women against their families and in favor of spending and the government began doing the, all this and what happened finally the indian women looked at the advertisement sang the songs but did not buy the goods <laughs> i will tell you how it worked in real economic terms what i am telling you may be a joke but it is such a serious issue for all of us to understand the indian gdp to savings ratio savings to gdp ratio at that time was 22 to 23% our total investment was 24% of the gdp the general economic assumption is that there is a uh, an investment output ratio if you invest 4 rupees you will get 1 rupee output so if you invest 24% you will get 6% growth rate so your investment ratio has to improve to 32% for you to get 8% growth rate and we can't save that much and so the only way is to let in foreign investment so that 8% foreign investment coming in will promote the growth from 6% to 8% was the common mantra of all the governments in the country including the government with which i had some friendly relationship i could talk to them they always used to put this logic now statistics is available from 1991 to 2011 as to who funded the indian economic growth from 1911 to 1991 to 
the total investment in india out of the total investment in india only 1.2% investment came from outside 98.8% investment was generated by local savings and the savings to gdp ratio went up from 23% to as high as 38% in the year 2009 this stunned the world shankaracharya who was the advisor to the government of india he wrote an article in business standard i can't understand this country this is the only country in the world which has come up of all the developing nations without any foreign investment without any significant exports and i want to read out to you what goldman sachs said in its report of 2010 october about what will be the indian infrastructure requirements they said indian infrastructure requirements will be 400 billion dollars then it was revised to 800 billion dollars then it was revised to 1.3 trillion dollars and finally it was revised to 1.7 trillion dollars we were told when the indian infrastructure requirements will be 400 billion dollars that india cannot fund this requirement and we need investment from outside and if the requirements are 1.7 trillion dollars what would be the condition see what the goldman sachs report global economic paper number 187 of goldman sachs says infrastructure 1.7 trillion in the next decade is considerably higher than the previous estimates rising national savings and robust bank balance sheet allows the allows india to make may, uh, to meet its infrastructure requirement domestically the main channel for funding infrastructure currently is household savings intermediated through the financial sector the goldman sachs estimated that indian savings will rise to 40% of the gdp in 2016 and will remain like this till 2026 and between 2016 and 2026 the annual cash savings in india by the families will be 800 billion dollars which is equal to all the bank advances today this will be the marginal savings every year and it says this is a model which is a unique model it says an excessive reliance on government spending or external financing can lead to boom and burst the experience of other countries funding infrastructure such as uh, infrastructure needs suggest that a sustainable model is to build a healthy balance sheet and reliance on domestic savings channeled through long term funds as india is doing india is held out as the model for funding infrastructure without foreign investment none of the iit students had even heard of this report of goldman sachs so i came to the conclusion that if you have to trigger indians you must first make them understand india the history of india the philosophy of india the spirit of india and the performing capabilities of india do you think the chartered accountants are an exception to this weakness the chartered accountants are as much part of the intellectual lethargy of india and this is a very painful experience because this profession attracts some of the best minds in the country for 30 40 years from 1970 when i joined this profession and we are a very intelligent profession but i always appeal to my chartered accountant friends you must also become an intellectual profession what is the difference between being an intelligent person and an intellectual an intelligent person thinks and works only for himself an intellectual thinks for others unlike today's definition of intellectualism anyone who speaks in english is an intellectual <laughs> that is a very poor and trivial definition of what intellectualism means intellectualism has to be an in depth understanding about what the society is in which you work bertrand russell wrote an essay which i read as a student in sslc examination the title of the essay was is happiness still possible bertrand russell said in the developed nations there is no scope for happiness for the youth and the educated 
there is happiness for the youths and educated only in countries and particularly countries like india where the youth will find enormous challenges to work for the country you know happiness is not in raising your bank balances yes it does give happiness for a while but you need something more than bank balances you need something more than your balance sheet to satisfy you and where do you get this inspiration from the whole world has been now driven to greed and what has been the consequence of greed today the economist himself has come out and said we have no answer when lehman brothers fell in september 2008 the der spiegel magazine in germany which is equal to the india today magazine here they asked five nobel prize winning economists gentlemen please tell us what happened what is the cause of what happened and please tell us how to come out of it and the economists names were edmund fell phelps robert lucas reynard selton ralph samuelson and joseph stiglitz these were the people on whose guidance the world economy was moving for the last 30 40 years they were given nobel prize for their thoughts for their theory for their models and so the der spiegel magazine was entitled to ask them gentlemen we went by your advice now everything is in ruins please tell us how to come out of it their views are still appearing in the website of der spiegel magazine you can see it none of them could explain what was the cause of the crisis and none of them could say how to come out of it because the cause of the crisis was the very theories which they expounded how could they give you a solution out of their own theories how many people know today if the indian stock market is rising it is not because of any indian money getting into the indian stock market because 2.6 trillion dollars america has printed between 2009 and 2011 and that liquidity is pervading the world goldman sachs says indians will not invest more than 6% of their savings in stock market i'll tell you what is the proportion which they are giving indians will invest savings pattern between 2010 and 2019 60% in deposits 20% in insurance 14% in pensions 6% in stocks how many of us know that the sensex companies 30 companies produce only 1% of india's gdp the entire bsc 500 listed companies account for only 4% of india's gdp the total corporate sector accounts for only 14% of india's gdp we chartered accountants must understand what is the structure of the indian economy we are capable people intelligent people in fact i have found in my experience that a chartered accountant can understand business economics which is the real economics today market economics which is the real economics today financial economics which is the real economics today much better than any economist himself but the chartered accountant is not concerned about anything other than probably the movement in the value of this share or that share it's a failure of intellectualism which has made us intellectually so lethargic that what we are pursuing is not giving us any great happiness <clears throat> and why this is going to be fatally wrong i will explain to you now india was considered to be a failure as a society as an economy <clears throat> and the historians had pronounced all but the demise of india 20 years back but suddenly india began rising and everybody attributed it to globalization foreign investment but india again grew because of its domestic strength this has shocked the world they compared with china they compared with <coughs> east asian countries and found that india has an internal generating mechanism 
a power which other countries, other societies, other civilizations, other cultures seem to lack. And now the world has begun perceiving India differently. On the 12th of December 2012, the National Intelligence Council of America came out with, with its report about what the world will look like in 2030. And they said, India will begin catching up with China in 2010 and it will be one of the three world major powers, USA, China and India will be the third power. By 2060, India will overtake China. You know what, what this means? This does not mean that you will have more professional opportunities. <laughs> yes, you are going to have professional opportunities. But it means you have a very high responsibility when you grow as a global power. People would want to know about India. They would want to know about your philosophy. They would want to know about your culture, your way of life. What has made you this big? What has made you this great? Please tell us. You can't be quoting Milton. You must quote Thiruvalluvar. <laughs> you know, there is a need for India to understand itself and that is what will ignite you. And the ignition pump has to be inside. And this understanding about India, which the IIT students felt they were lacking. And they asked me to conduct a course, which is definitely a very big imposition on me. And I had to do it not for myself. For the benefit of the students, I will be very happy to tell you, 10 research scholars, five professors, including a professor from the psychiatry department who is studying the Indian psyche, as to why it is feeling so weak. Why it is not showing strength? Why is it not showing a dominating tendency? What is it that is holding back the Indian mind? What is it that is holding back India from getting ignited? This is the study of the professor who is attending that class. And two doctoral students have opted to do a research, to do a modeling based on my lectures. Why I am mentioning this is, High-end educational institutions which must be expounding India to the world is expounding the world to India without knowing anything about India. You can understand the extent of intellectual collapse. In fact, there is a need far from globalizing India. We have to Indianize the world. Why I tell you? The need is fundamental. Today the collapse of America as an economy is not because of collapse of any uh, particular index of economic structure, whether it is uh, um, fiscal deficit, whether it is uh, the um, current account deficit of America. Yes, America has been running current account deficit for the last 35 years. Between 1976 and 2009, 30 years out of 33 years, America incurred trade deficits of 8.5 trillion dollars. They could do it because they printed their dollar and gave it out because there is no difference between local exchange and foreign exchange for them. No other country could have done it. But American economy is collapsing today, not because anything is wrong with America, American technology, American business model, which are all very superior because the American society is collapsing. You know, 41 percent of the babies born in America are born for unwed mothers and 20 percent of them are born for pe children which go to school. 51 percent of the families are single parent families. Only 28 percent of the couple with children live as husband and wife. 21 percent of the men and women live together, anybody with any length of time, they want to, they do not want to marry because divorce is prohibitive. 55 percent of the first marriages end in divorce in 10 years. The second marriage is 67 percent end in divorce. If anybody has the tenacity to marry, 74 percent of the third marriages end in divorce. It does not have any hope for them. You know, this is a structural destruction of a society. 
because of which the savings which the American families used to do. The American families used to have a share of 70 percent of the national savings in 1983. In 2006, third quarter, their savings came down to 22 percent minus because they began spending more than their income. You know 30 crore Americans, 22 crore economically active Americans have 120 crore credit cards. Their houses are mortgaged. They are steeped in debts. They were unable to repay the debts and that is what caused the subcrime crisis which became the American crisis because the Americans had borrowed on the base of the mortgage documents of the American families which had become bankrupt and those documents could not be honored. They fell down in value. The crisis was exported to Europe. You know this society requires a model of life. That model of life cannot be in library. It cannot be in articles. It cannot be in textbooks. It has to be in a living form. Fortunately, we have a life in a living form. A life model which can be exported with pride. You know, in my travels across America, I had only spoken about Indian families, Indian respect for parents, Indian respect for elders, Indian respect for women. It has shocked them. You know, America contrived to be in this position. You know how? If a child were admitted to a school in America, they will ask the child to mug up a telephone number. Unless the child mugs up the telephone number, the child will not get admission. You know what is the telephone number? That is the telephone number of the nearest police station. If your father says anything, if your mother beats you, if your teacher curses you, you must ring up the police. I told them that our society still respects teachers, still, still respects parents, as a result of which the families look after the social security mechanism in this country. In America, the social security mechanism which takes care of the parents, the elders, the infirm, unemployed people is not the family because there is no family. It is the state. You know what is the unfunded social security obligations of America? 104 trillion dollars. Unfunded social security obligations. Whereas the American GDP is only 15.4 trillion dollars. This is a problem which has transcended limits of economics. They need a cultural revival. They need a social awakening. They need a spiritual input. They need a model of life. And when Nixon became the president of America in 1990, he constituted a study team under Mrs. Nixon for privatization of health security. And the committee came to the conclusion, yes, it has to be privatized, but it cannot be privatized because if you have to privatize it, you need families. We have lost the families. And they began giving tax concession for husband and wife to live together, not to divorce. That is not the thing for which a wife will live with the husband. With the result, they have nationalized the families and privatized the government. But you have a functioning mechanism here, the family. And if there is no family in this country, if the same kind of cultural degeneration, social fall takes place in India, what will happen to the Indian economy? Whether it is Harvard or Stanford, whether it is John Hopkins or any place, wherever I have gone and spoken, they have been stunned that there is such a close interaction between culture and economics. Our fundamental strength is our culture, our tradition, our respect for elders, our respect for women. Most people do not know that we respect our women so much. And what is the consequence of it? I will conclude my speech with this because this is the way we have been self-flagellating so much that we do not know about truth about what India is. I am going to now read out to you an article which appeared in the Times magazine, one Libby Purvis wrote after the Delhi rape, 
that the Delhi rape case should shatter our Bollywood fantasies of heady spirituality in India. That Europeans have ignored the Indian culture which is murderous, hyena like male contempt. It's a barbaric society and we were believing this cinema from Bollywood and thinking India was a spiritually evolved country. This is what they wrote on the basis of the Delhi rape, which was the most horrendous, I agree. But the Indian media turned out India to be a country of rapists and murderers. Then, fortunately for India, a Western woman by name Emmer Othol, she wrote a reply to this lady in the Guardian newspaper. She wrote in the Times, this lady wrote after 10 days in the Guardian on January 1, 2013. She intervened and tore apart Parvis and her lies. Emma wrote that Parvis and others pontificate with a sense of cultural superiority that a rape is something that happens only there. Read India and something which is the civilized West has somehow gotten over. Emma pointed out that while the BBC reports as if shocking statistics that a woman is raped in Delhi every 14 hours, which equals 625 a year. In England and Wales, which has 3.5 times the population of Delhi, the proportion of rape is 9,500 or 4 times the proportion of rape in Delhi. And not only that, you had a rape in Delhi in December, the whole country came to a standstill for one month. There was nothing, the parliament was stopped, everything happened. But there is a rape, similar rape takes place in Steubenville in America in August. A girl of 16 is dragged from party to party. She becomes unconscious. She was repeatedly raped by a basketball team. The news doesn't come out because the basketball crazy population prevented the news from coming out. One blogger put it out in October, in, in November. A legal charge was made against him. After the Delhi rape became so public, Wall Street Journal published this news item. After four months, they arrested the basketball team persons responsible for this. So, Emmer said it can't even become a news in our country. And within 10 days of Emmer writing an article, she said 9,500 rapes. No, it is 95,000 rapes. That is what the Home Ministry in Britain said. Ten days later, Emmer's data was found to be gross underestimation of rapes in UK in an article in Independent, 10th January 2013. 10,000 assaults, 1,000 rapists sentenced. In America, only 5% of the rapists ever face arrest. 75% of the rapes are unreported. On the scale of America, India should have permit 1.7 million rapes. On the scale of Britain, India should permit 3.4 million rapes. We have 22,000 reported rapes. Even one rape is a shame on the country. But do you shame a country like this? I am putting it to you the psychology of demeaning India by Indians. How can you ignite this country? Unless you exercise your mind about the fatal weakness of seeing wrong things in India. Wrong things in our thinking, wrong things in our philosophy, wrong things. In, there is no country which has no problem. Every country has a problem. There are countries whose problems are incurable. Take for instance Sweden, which is regarded as number two in human development index. 50% of the women are, 50% uh, of the professionals are women, IAS officers, women parliamentarians, women, 100% universal education. And so they are number one in, number two in human development index. 67% of the women live with anybody for any length of time without marriage. And the children born are the property of the government. And we are told we should become like Sweden. And our writers, our economists, our columnists, our intellectuals, our leaders, our civil servants say we should become like Sweden. Do we know the consequence? You understand the heavy intellectual responsibility all of us are bearing. The English educated Indian is party to demeaning India. And we are part of it. Unless you bear this sense of guilt, 
unless you overcome it i am not saying emotionally or sentimentally you must do it on facts we need an iit like course for chartered accountants to ignite them it cannot happen by one lecture the iit people said one lecture can't do it so the institute of chartered accountants of india should undertake an exercise to make indians sensitized about india its history its traditions the fact about its economy its history its current potentialities how the world thinks about india we need a course outside your syllabus then the chartered accountants will be ignited you need to be ignited because you are going to represent an imperial india a powerful india a world power india with a slavish mindset which concedes superiority to the west and the rest either you look west or look east the finance minister says you don't look at yourself <laughs> our look west policy should be replaced by our look east policy what about look at ourselves so my appeal to all of you is that we are a very very important profession in this country because our influence is totally disproportionate to our number we connect to very important people we connect to money people we connect to business people and we deal with the critical subjects of the indian economy we have our own influence but we don't understand unless some somebody comes and shows who you are we are not going to realize our strength we are not realizing our strength like hanuman is partly because of two reasons we don't know about ourselves we don't know about the country my advice would be let the sirc start as an example a four lecture series on this subject because in one lecture you can't cover everything the what i have given you only a glimpse of what one needs to know so it's a very major responsibility because you have attempted this subject you can't leave it after beginning it otherwise you should never have attempted this subject and it is not a subject which is dealt with casually because you have to develop a very powerful introspection and that introspection has to be infective then we will understand how this discourse can be taken i am extremely happy that i got this opportunity to share my thoughts with you and now having taken you to a very difficult course of sensitizing you against our own predilections i will now talk a few words about mr m r narayan when i met him in 1973 here there is a very critical meeting Mr. G. V. Raman was the star of that meeting. He had called a requisitioned meeting to question some non-observance of a convention in the election of office bearers. That was the first time I was introduced to the committee of chartered accountants because I was in 1972 I qualified and I joined Gauri Kanthan Company in 1993. Afterwards, when Mr. Narayanan spoke in that meeting, I was so impressed. I went and met him, sir. I was so happy to hear your speech. the many facets which i never knew about the accounting the profession the way the council functions the council politics i would never have learnt but for your exposition then in 1975 our relationship grew more intensely when the emergency was declared i had to go underground and i was employed with mr gaurikant the gaurikant and company and they gave me leave for 6 months to work underground and i had given a resignation letter and left the office but i was collecting my salary i was given the responsibility of looking after 150 families whose breadwinners were in jail and we had to feed those families i used to go every month to collect money from mr g narayan swami and mr m r narayan unfailingly they used to give me money which was at that time beyond their capacity to that was so 150 families were funded for 18 months that is how my relationship with mr narayanan and g narayan swami grew 
and i owe my debt of gratitude to gaurikant and company because they gave me 6 months leave with their resignation letter so if the police came for an inquiry they could say the man has left the organization i don't know whether mr raman recollects this what do we learn from here you can talk about mr narayanan's accounting skills his capacity to handle tax problems his leadership to the accounting profession but he was far more involvement with the country sentimentally that is a trait which the lawyers of this country had demonstrated to the world prior to independence a country can't grow a country can't become powerful it can't do its duty to the world even if it becomes a global power unless we discharge our duty to the country my appeal to all of you is set apart some time to think about all this first where do we stand what is our responsibility and it is my appeal to all of you that we need to become different if we continue like this history will reject us as of no consequence i am very sad to make this remark but i am forced to make this remark with the appeal that we can do so much but we are not doing anything because we don't devote that kind of attention we don't generate that spirit and we don't have that model to shape the mind of the young chartered accountant who is becoming even more important than chartered accountants have been in our times thank you very much thank you very very much sir and i just like to make five points on his speech one we obviously recognize the need for an ignite series of lectures that we should perhaps initiate to discuss and debate issues that are relevant and meaningful two the choice of speaker somehow preceded the choice of the topic and given that the speaker was shri sg the topic had to reflect and perhaps do complete justice to the persona of shri sg and ladies and gentlemen it had to be ignite rather than anything else um listening to shri sg is like reading an aldous huxley book i'm sure there are other comp- comparisons his speech transcended time geographies sp- spoke of social statistics economic perspectives philosophy the mauryas the megasthenes oecd freddy mac fanny may spirituality cultural ethos moral fabric and most importantly a compelling need for national pride Ladies and gentlemen we truly believe that no man could have delivered all this better and in a greater style and flair for we are accountants uh, perpetually regarded to be methodical professional perfectionists we are often branded monochromatic and gray it's precisely this perception that has not gotten us very far it's this very mold that the speeches such as these seek to change or even decimate to ignite a spark i'll be the small spark that would hopefully see a more feared respected and formidable profession that vcs should aspire for be inspired and ignited to be and i just like to conclude you know he specifically said don't quote milton quote thirukural so if i were to liken um, icai to a parent and uh, gurumurthy to an offspring then the relevant quote would have to be mahan tandai katru mudavi even tandai ennotran kol enum sol Ladies and gentlemen may I request you to please give Sri SG a standing ovation Could I now request CAPR Lord Arunoli to please propose the vote of thanks Yeah, yeah. one moment uh, Yeah the memento is there sir No no one moment <laughs> <laughs> Okay this is super charged so I forgot the moment Yeah yeah this, this uh, I am really thrilled the way in which he has expressed about our society ourselves and the indian indian culture where the indian culture has got a lot of values is not only the social value it is also the economic value and it is not only cultural value it is the entire super super power of the entire world sir so we are really you know we are thrilled that you know we, when we have chosen this topic of igniting child again ca minds we thought it is aligned with it is in fitness of the earth that we we at the sarc have got a action plan which was published in the newsletter where the first topic was empowerment of chartered accountants where we thought we must know our our strengths and weaknesses in the profession sir now we are broad basing that after hearing you 
that we would like to have a course of this kind where we have to empower ourselves by knowing our strengths, our society, and we should be, that should be within all of us. I think we will certainly take your uh, advice and have some courses uh, for igniting the really the CF minds and to empower them during this year. Thank you very much. And uh, I recognize the presence of my colleague uh, Sekia, who is a regional council member here. Okay, thank you. Could I please uh, request Sri Venkateshan to hand over a memento to Sri Gurumurthy and Sri Narayan Swami? Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together. வணக்கம் நன்றே துவங்கிய இன்றைய தினம் நினைவில் என்றும் நிற்க வணங்கி பழமையிலும் புதுமைக்கான புனி புதுமையிலும் புனிதம் காண புனிதத்தில் வெற்றி காண வெற்றியில் வெள்ளோட்டம் காண வெள்ளோட்டத்தில் வெற்றிடம் செல்ல காரணம் அரசியல் என்றே என்று சொன்னாலும் என்றாலும் வெட்டி வா என்றால் கட்டி வருவான் கோடு போட்டால் ரோடு போடுவான் உள்ளதா என்றால் உன்னதமே என்பான் அவனுக்கு சுட்டு போட்டாலும் வராது தவறு செய்ய வராது தவறியும் செய்வதை சொல்ல தெரியாது தவறியும் செய்வதை சொல்ல வராது சொல்லியும் மிகைப்படுத்த வராது மட்டமே தட்டினாலும் முன்னேற்றத்தின் பாதையில் இருந்து நழுவ வராது முன்னேற்றத்தின் அளவுகோல் பணமே என்றாலும் இல்லை இல்லை குணமே என்ற நிலை வர வேண்டிய இந்திய பட்டய கணக்காளர்கள் என்ற நிலையில் கொண்டு குரு வணக்கம் செயல் வணக்கம் பொருள் வணக்கம் சொல்ல வந்தேன் திரு குருமூர்த்தி அவர்களுக்கு நன்றி சொல்லி செயல் வடிவம் கொடுத்த உங்கள் அனைவருக்கும் நன்றி சொல்லி பொருள்தனை நினைவில் கொண்டு சொன்ன பொருள்தனை நினைவில் கொண்டு முன்னேற்றத்திற்கு வழிவகுப்போம் என்று சொல்லி அதற்கொரு நன்றி சொல்லி இன்றைய நாளும் நன்றே என்று நாளை நமதே என்று பாராட்டி அமைகிறேன் நன்றி வணக்கம்